This is the first lecture for Friday, April 3rd. After today, we have our quiz today, then we'll pretty much be all caught up for this whole time that we made this transition from meeting in person to online classes for the rest of the semester. These unusual times, so there's a lot of material that is included for this course from spring break until now. From this week on, the end of this week on, then it'll be a lot more manageable. We'll have a week of lectures and a quiz and a week of lectures and a quiz. And along the way, we have a, a weekly assignments that you'll turn in as well. So what we're looking at in terms of community ecology, were patterns of species diversity. We're looking at different explanations for why you find the type of diversity that you find, the patterns. Why are some communities very diverse? Why are others not so diverse? And the last topic of this was, is biodiversity. And I made the point before that people are really interested in biodiversity. Why are they so interested in biodiversity? There's a number of different things. Genetically modified organisms, habitat destruction, the way that we utilize organisms that are all related to maintaining biodiversity. And there's a big emphasis placed on maintaining biodiversity. So in this section, we're going to see some of the reasons why there is so much emphasis placed on biodiversity. <clears throat> so to begin with, one of the ways of looking at diversity in communities, as you probably remember, is the number of species. How many species are there? It's a simple metric of measuring diversity in a community. It's not the only one, and there's limits of just looking at the number of species. But it's a valid question in terms of diversity within communities. How many species are there? How many species are there out there that can be found in these different communities? Well, to date, there's been about 2 million different species, all kinds of different organisms that have been described. They've been given a, a name, a genus name and a species name. <clears throat> Turtus migratorius, the robin. There's a lot of species that have yet to be described. No one knows how many that is, but there's different estimates. Estimates as high as 13 million. That maybe there's 13 million species. So we've only described 2 million, which seems like a lot, but <clears throat> 13 million is obviously a lot more than 2 million. Maybe there's 11 million out there that haven't even been discovered yet and named. Well, if you look at the size of a, a, a species within a certain group, size of birds, size of insects, size of fish, of these different groups, well, what you find is that there's not very many big ones. There's not very many small ones. There's not very, very many big giant ones. There's not very many tiny little ones. <clears throat> and the average size for species within a group tends to be somewhere in the middle, intermediate. And this is true for insects. And the, the reason that this is useful is because about one of every three species on Earth is an insect. Insects are so successful in terms of the number of species, the niches that they occupy, at least on land, not so much on the water. But there are a lot of species. So the thought is, if you look at a community and you focus on insects and you're quantifying the number of insects and you're quantifying diversity in terms of insects, there's a lot of emphasis placed on the, the role of insects, at least in terrestrial ecosystems, communities. And, and the, the thought is 
if you have a handle on how many insect species there are, insects are so common and so abundant and, and dominate communities in a lot of ways that if you can figure out what's going on with the insects, then that probably applies to the community as a whole. If you're trying to describe whether a community is diverse or not, and you have a, an idea of, of whether in terms of insects, this community is diverse compared to others, then that goes a long way towards referencing a particular community in relation to others. Well, why is this biodiversity so important? Why is it emphasized so much? That's what I want to talk about now. <clears throat> There's a, a, a small fraction of species out there have been investigated in terms of different biomedical uses, different drugs, different compounds that can be derived from plants or animals, toxin, or some kind of a substance that's produced in some biochemical pathway in an organism. So we have a selfish interest and looking at all these different biological compounds and using those for ourselves. Things like nicotine and morphine and there's a whole bunch of different things that are that are used for uh, in humans that, that we usually don't use the natural source but we find some some kind of chemical and we start using it as a drug and we synthesize, we have some synthetic version of this drug that we can make. But there's a lot of, of compounds out there that we take advantage of. $300 billion in terms of the pharmaceutical industry using chemicals that are derived from plants. There's a lot of people, in fact, the majority of people out there in the US and a lot of places around the world think that it's important for us <clears throat> to have concern for our fellow living things. That it, it's some, uh, some thing of importance. To, it's a, a moral imperative that we're not just concerned about ourselves. Uh, granted, there's a lot of people that are very selfish, don't care about a rhinoceros going extinct. They don't care about many other species, and that it's humans that are way more important than anything else and should win out over everything. So that's a, an important consideration for a lot of people. Young, idealistic people like a lot of you have a tremendous amount of concern for other living things besides humans. There are some important services, and this is what we're going to focus our attention on if you have a community that's got a lot of community members, or in other words, this community is very diverse, then it provides a lot of services for the surrounding area and, for again, for our selfish purposes, provides a lot of services for humans. Keeping pests down, providing oxygen, increasing biomass, a number of different things. That, that, that fully functioning communities provide. And as these communities become less diverse, or in other words, as the number of species declines in a community, then they tend to function less optimally, and the degree to which they provide these services becomes less. So let's look at some of these. Basically, we're going to relate the number of species in a community or in other words, how diverse a community is, to some of the functions of that community, some of the characteristics of that community. <clears throat> so one thing that's related to diversity in a community is stability. The more diverse a community is, the more stable it tends to be. So the more resistant it is, to perturbation, the more resistant it is to invaders, the more resistant it is to, to uh, stressful environmental conditions. So let's look at this idea of stability. If diversity is related to stability, what, is, what, is, what are we talking about in terms of stability? 
there's two ways you can look at stability. One is resistance, resistance to change. The more diverse a community is, the more resistant it is to change. Another way of looking at stability is resilience. So not so much unyielding in terms of change, but when change takes place, then a community is very good at bouncing back or being resilient. So stability is important for community function, optimal community function, providing all these services that communities do. And diversity is closely related to stability. So stability is important for maintaining these functions or services. And biodiversity is important for maintaining stability. And on, on the other hand, stability is important for maintaining biodiversity. The more unstable a community is, then the, the more it tends towards being less diverse and providing those functions to a lesser degree. So well, let's look at five different explanations for the relationship between biodiversity and community service. And again, by community service, I mean by how much water stability is there in this community, how much water conservation is there that's provided by this community being stable and this community being biodiverse. How much productivity is there? How much oxygen? How much is the soil improved? How much are to uh, uh, toxic substances filtered out of the ecosystem? There's a number of different services like that that are provided by biodiverse communities and by stable communities. So first let's look at those some thoughts about how diversity is related to stability and functioning of communities. So first of all there's this idea of stability that it's really stability that's important. The more stable a community is the better it is at providing those services. And if stability is related to the number of species in a community, and the number of species is really reflected, defined by species richness, then this figure here shows species richness increasing, which is the number of species, which has increased biodiversity, and increased community services. <clears throat> so it's just... Uh, increased number of species, increased biodiversity, increased stability, and these community services that I mentioned are provided to a higher degree. There's another way of looking at this in terms of how everything fits together. It's not just the number of species that are in a community, but it's how they interact. And that there's some that are that uh, perform similar functions but ultimately, you have this community that's functioning in an optimal way or in a way that works well by having all these different components that are similar to rivets that are holding a plane together, for instance. And you can remove a rivet here or there, and the plane still holds together. This plane still flies. But if you get to the point where you're removing too many rivets, then one part of the plane doesn't work, another part of the plane doesn't work. There's problems with this part or that part, the wings or the, the body or the tail. And so community members or individual species are like rivets in an airplane. And you tend to have these, these thresholds that are reached. You remove some of them and then the community functions, community services declines and you remove some more. And so species richness is related to these community members that are filling these roles, some of which are redundant, but they basically operate by <clears throat> the sum of the parts being greater than the whole. Closely related to this is this idea of redundancy. If you've got a whole bunch of different species in a community, some of those species are filling similar niches. Not the same niche, but similar niches. And so that you can lose a species here, you can lose a species there, and somebody else can take its place. 
so that there's redundancy. It's not the same species occupying the same niche as some other species, but a similar enough niche so that when you lose one, another one can take its place. You lose another one, another one can take its place. Of course, there's limits to this. And as you reduce biodiversity, you reduce the ability of, of different species to fill the role of other ones. So in other words, the redundancy reaches a point where you don't have anybody to replace who's gone. And then you have this drastic drop off in community service. So in this case, species richness up to a point, you have this one that's gone, it's replaced by another one. You have this one that's gone, it's replaced by another one, but you get to a point where there's nothing to replace the ones that are gone. And another hypothesis <clears throat> or explanation for a community function is that there's a lot of different species in a community, but there's some that play a more important role than others. When we get to this next topic of looking at community members, we'll focus on keystone species. Just like the name implies, these are key species in a community. So that their function, their contribution to how a community operates or how, how well a community functions, how well a community provides services to humans and, and other organisms in the surrounding areas, that is related to species richness. But there's some, in this figure it's these red, red dots, those are species that are keystone species. So if you take out one red dot, another red dot, another red, these red dots have more of an influence on how this, the community functions and, in turn, how well the community provides services. And that it's, it's not ne necessarily just removing one species and other species and other species that is impacting the ability of the community to provide these services. But it's when you remove keystone species that are way more important than just your average species in a community. And then the last one is that there's, there's this idea that it's not really easy to predict what's going to happen when species are removed from a community. In the long run, and on, on a broad scale, the fewer species you have in a community, the, the less well that that community is going to function, the less that community is able to provide these services. But it's not at a, at a doesn't follow a pattern that's easy predict, easy to predict. And so it's a lot more, well, based unpredictable is exactly what it is. Well, I've been talking about these different services that communities provide. For humans, we're selfish. Oh, we want clean water, clean air. We want flood control. And we want to be able to harvest things like food and timber, fish, whatever. We want to make money from ecotourism. We want to have communities that are functioning for pest control. This is a, a, a longer list than I mentioned before, but it's still a rel relatively short list in terms of services that are provided by communities. And again, the better functioning communities are, the better they are at providing these services. We want these services. We're selfish. And so as humans, we want these services provided. And by having more species in a community, or in other words, having a diverse community, having high biodiversity, leads to greater stability better resilience and better resistance to change. And these services are provided at a higher degree, which is exactly what we want as humans. Well, let's take a few minutes to talk about the different members that you find in a community. There's a lot of different species in a community. Some of them are indigenous or they're, they're found there naturally as opposed to being introduced by humans. So if you showed up someplace without the influence of humans, you'd find some species that occurred there naturally. It's a 
native species or indigenous. We talk about people the same way, indigenous people. There are some species that are found in a location and nowhere else in the world. I mentioned this before talking about islands. These are endemic species. So there's some species that are endemic to Rhode Island or they're endemic to New England, which means they're found only in Rhode Island or they're found only in New England, nowhere else in the world. Endemic. Of course, those populations tend to be small. Those species tend to be vulnerable to extinction threats being on the endangered species list. What we're seeing these days is that there's a huge number of non-native species. Now, there's different terms that are used by different people that are specialized in this. Invasive species, alien species, exotic species, they all mean pretty much the same thing in terms of them being non-native, but some are introduced by different means or introduced by humans for the most part. We live in this global world where we originally were sailing around. The, these things would come off the ship. We would introduce goats and cows and pigs and chickens to islands. And, and they would wreak havoc on some of these rats would jump off the ship. Snakes would, are going around. And now there's transport of all kinds of different invasive species or non-native species. Huge impact on communities around the world. And it's really, really, really common to find invasive species all over the place, plants, animals, other organisms as well. There's also indicator species, which are good species in terms of indicating or signifying some kind of response to environmental change. They're more sensitive to environmental change. Their population is affected. They die, they're stressed, they, their population numbers go down. They indicate, especially negative impacts on a community. And then there's these keystone species that I mentioned before, where they have, they're involved in a lot of different interactions. If you remove a keystone species, they influence a lot of other species well beyond their numbers, or their biomass, they're much more important than they would appear to be based on how many of them there are. So we'll look at some examples of those. Basically, we'll look at some indicator species, we'll look at some keystone species, and then we'll be done with this, this section. Indicator species in terrestrial ecosystems, birds. Birds are very good indica indicator species. You know, it's a, it's a classical canary in the cold mine, coal mine that uh, senses whether there's enough oxygen there or there's some toxic gas that's coming out. Birds are all over the place, sensitive to environmental change. And so birds are good indicator species. As the bird population goes, the whole community goes, and, and they're able to predict these changes that are coming in advance of, <clears throat> of what other species are saying about a community sometimes. In aquatic communities, trout are a good example. They're, they're, uh, they feed on different, different organisms and they're uh, found in different parts of lakes and different parts of streams and rivers. And so they have some pretty high standards in terms of environmental conditions to be able to survive. When the water gets to be warmer, when there's less oxygen, trout are some of the first animals to go. They're good indicator species. Now, one of the things that has been found to be taking place around the world and in North America quite a bit as well is the reduction in populations of amphibians. Amphibians are very good indicator species. And you can imagine why they might be because they spend part of their life on land, part of their life in the water. They're they're utilizing both of these habitats. They're susceptible to changes that are taking place in both of those habitats. So if there's some kind of toxin, if there's some kind of change in the environmental conditions, they might experience it on land and in the water both. There's been a huge decline in 
amphibian populations over the last couple of decades in, in the United States. People are really concerned about amphibian populations. It's advantageous to be able to use them as indicator species to, to show what's happening to communities as a whole, but it's worrisome that so many amphibian populations have declined. Keystone species, one last thing about the keystone species is that their importance because of whatever reason, a variety of different reasons, the number of interactions that they're involved with, the, the snowball effect that they have, these, these changes, drastic changes that take place as a result of the keystone species population being reduced or keystone species being eliminated from a, a community. But they have a bigger role than their numbers would suggest. They have a bigger role than their biomass, how much they all weigh, suggests. So there's a number of examples of keystone species. Sometimes it's not to even realize that these are keystone species until they're gone. Sometimes you can manipulate a community. But here's some examples, and I think these will make sense when you think about them in terms of the interactions that they're having with other organisms and the way that they're shaping an entire community. Bees. Bees are big pollinators. Hummingbirds, big pollinators. Bats, big pollinators. And, and so there's a lot of concern about bees and the lack of bees. <clears throat> If you have bees these days, you can you get hired to take your bees to some orchard and turn them loose, and they're pollinating the trees there. You can there's some people that that's what they do for their living is take their beehives around and rent them out basically. And and there's also keystone species that have big influence on a number of different organisms, plants, especially in terms of dispersal. And then there's these that modify the habitat quite a bit. Elephants pushing trees over. They're modifying the habitat out to a great deal, which has a big influence on a lot of other organisms. Beavers, they dam a stream and create a pond, and that's a whole ecosystem for a whole bunch of other organisms. And then there's uh, starfish and uh, sea otters, these classic examples of <clears throat> keystone species that when they're gone or when their population is reduced, there's big changes to starfish in terms of the other organisms taking taking off the population of whatever the starfish were eating explodes. Sea urchins are a big prey of sea otters, and when the sea otters population was way down, the urchin population was very large, and they were going along feeding on these little kelp, giant kelp, and destroying entire forests of giant kelp. So these kelp forests were being mowed down by urchins that were historically eaten by otters. So there's a number of different examples of keystone species. Keystone species receive a lot of attention, sometimes a lot of money, so people are... Uh, interested in having their species that they're studying be called keystone species, sometimes even if they're not. Okay, so that's the first lecture for Friday, April 3rd. We're going to have a second, much shorter lecture beginning on this topic of succession. We've looked at communities and a number of different aspects of communities in terms of how diverse they are, in terms of, of how they respond to changes or what happens when a community changes, and uh, equilib equilibrium and non-equilibrium models. So we're going to specifically look at how communities change over time on this topic of succession.